Hey there, this is your host, Dr. Lori Friesen, and you're listening to episode number 280 of Beginning Teacher Talk. Just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. I'm dedicated to being the mentor for you that I wish I had when I first started teaching. In this podcast, we talk about all of the -the behind-the-scenes stuff about teaching you really need to know but didn't learn when you were in university. And we share the most amazing resources, tips, and strategies out there so you can become the teacher you've always dreamed of being. Let's start the show. Well, hey there, my friends, and welcome to episode number 280. Today, we are going to talk about a topic that has come up a lot inside the Classroom Management Club this past year. I'm sure you are managing a lot of this in your own classroom, and that is ODD students, how to manage oppositional defiant disorder students in your elementary classroom. I know this has become increasingly challenging, especially post-COVID. We've seen a lot more behaviors that we had never seen in the classroom before. But I do want to encourage you, and today, after this this episode today, I think you're going to feel a lot more confident about how to manage these students, and you're going to understand this disorder a lot better. What you might not know is that years ago, I almost became a mom. I mean, I'm a bonus mom to three boys. We're going to talk about that in this podcast episode, actually. But when I was teaching second grade, I had a little boy in my class very early on in my teaching career. I think it was my second or third year teaching who was in foster care and I just fell in love with him and I seriously considered adopting him. But then I met his older brother who was in fourth grade and he was diagnosed with ODD and his behavior scared me so much. He was so angry. He was so off the charts, like wild that I ended up deciding against it because at that age, I felt so intimidated. I felt so unprepared to go home to a child who would challenge me that way. But over my decade of being in the classroom, I ended up having many ODD students, and I felt like I became more and more prepared for the special challenges they present over the years because it became less of a surprise that they would behave that way. I just began to understand, okay, this is just typical for a student who has ODD. And once you're able to understand and separate from it a little bit, although it's hard, we're going to talk about strategies that you can do that. Once you understand that this is just, it's a diagnosis based on many different factors, then it's a lot easier to realize, okay, this is just normal for them. And in fact, one of my bonus kids presented with many of the same symptoms of ODD. I met him more than 10 years ago now, and he was never formally diagnosed with ODD, but I had plenty of opportunities to practice everything that I'm about to share with you here because he presented with a lot of the same symptoms, a lot of the same behaviors that we see in ODD students. So this is not new to me. I've had a lot of experience both as a classroom teacher and as a mom with kids who present as ODD. And I feel very qualified to share with you what works with these kids and how you can manage them. So kids who have ODD are hands down probably the most challenging students you'll ever have in your classroom, but it's actually not all the child's fault. And that's where I want to begin today. Brain scans of kids diagnosed with ODD suggest that they actually have subtle differences in the part of their brain that's responsible for reasoning, for judgment, and for impulse control. So this is actually a neurological pattern that we can see. And according to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, these kids may have trouble identifying and interpreting social cues, and they tend to see hostile intent in neutral situations. That was eye-opening to me. They tend to see hostile intent in neutral situations. So when you feel like the world is constantly out to get you, or you feel unsafe, those kids really try to preserve their own safety. So these kids aren't trying to be brats. They aren't kids who are doing the exact, even though they are doing the exact opposite of what their teachers say, they aren't doing it just to be like difficult. They are literally just trying to cope with what their brain has given them as a priority. They feel the need to control their environments in order to feel 
safe. And if you don't get anything else out of this podcast other than that today, I want to reiterate that kids who have ODD feel the need to control their environments in order to feel safe. And it's really important that if we have a child in our classrooms who we think might need an ODD diagnosis, that we check it out, that we talk to the relevant people in our school that need to know about this. Because if ODD isn't addressed when kids are young, it can evolve into conduct disorder, which is where the big troubles really start. And kids start doing things like setting fires and committing crimes. But there is hope because intensive therapy and support can help turn kids around before they get there. So we're going to talk more about who you can ask for help with these students. Don't try to manage this on your own. You're, on your own. You're going to need some help. So first, what exactly is Oppositional Defiant Disorder or ODD? So we need to understand that ODD is a psychiatric disorder that's diagnosed in children and adolescents. Typically, you're going to see a consistent pattern of negative, hostile, and defiant behavior, especially towards authority figures such as parents, teachers, and other adults. So it won't be just you. They tend to live in a state of chronic aggression. It's like they're permanently unsettled. You might say good morning to them when they get to school and they'll respond with things like shut up or I hate you, right? It feels, it can feel really bad. It's pretty hard not to take that personally because it feels like they really do hate you in that moment. And it can make you question everything you thought you knew about kids. It can make you think, God, like, how come I can't get to this child? So if you're feeling that way, it's normal. I had the same experience with my bonus son at that time when I first met him. It was like, oh my gosh, like he just would get aggressive and it felt like for no reason at all, right? So the diagnostic criteria as outlined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is that specific behaviors and symptoms must be present for a diagnosis. So things like temper tantrums, arguing with adults, actively refusing to comply with rules, deliberately annoying others. Again, pretty hard to keep your cool around. And it's really important to recognize that ODD often emerges in childhood and can persist into adolescence if it's left untreated, or we haven't given them any skills to manage the ODD. And understanding the developmental aspects of the disorder can really help us to frame our expectations and our interventions appropriately. So the other thing that's a little bit complicated about ODD is that it can also coexist with other conditions like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, or anxiety disorders or mood disorders. So understanding the potential of all of these existing at once together can provide insight into how complex it can be to manage ODD. So don't worry, there's hope. We're going to talk about how you can do this in your classroom. Now, here's the most interesting part and maybe the most frustrating part. But according to the Mayo Clinic, there's no clear cause of oppositional defiant disorder. So it can be a a combination of genetic and environmental factors that contribute to a child presenting with ODD. So in terms of genetics, a child's natural personality or character, their temperament may contribute to developing ODD. So differences in the way nerves and the brain function can play a role. So that is clearly part of what may be causing ODD in some children. But there's also the environment. There's problems with parenting that may involve a lack of supervision, inconsistent or harsh discipline, or abuse or neglect can also contribute to developing ODD. And when I think back to that child's brother who I almost adopted and his anger and his frustration, remember these kids were both in foster care. So we don't know what kind of abuse or neglect or what kind of inconsistent home life they had experienced up until that that point in their tiny li- lives. Remember, these kids are seven, eight, nine years old, and they may be managing a lot in their environment. And just a lot of parents who aren't around that could contribute to children acting out and having ODD, feeling unsafe because of the inconsistency. So of course, ODD can really impact a student's learning and academic performance in the classroom, and they may struggle to really focus in class. They might consistently disrupt the learning environment and have a really hard time building positive relationships with their classmates. So if you're seeing these symptoms, I'm going to list seven different things that are very common in ODD students, and then we're going to talk about how to manage these kids in your classroom. 
So the first thing you're going to see is frequent defiance. Students with ODD often have like a consistent pattern of challenging authority and rules. They refuse to comply with requests, with directions, or with instructions from teachers and other adults. They are highly argumentative, so they tend to get into frequent arguments, often becoming really defensive or confrontational when they're challenged or when they're corrected. Again, so hard to deal with, I know. They have intense anger outbursts. They can be triggered by seemingly like nothing at all, like very small issues. Like I've had students throw things across the room because they didn't get the seat they wanted on the carpet or scream bloody murder because they were in a group they didn't like, right? Like these, these outbursts are so derailing for the whole morning or the whole afternoon. And it can be so challenging to manage in your classroom. So I get it. Like I've been there. I've had these students. I totally get it. They also might deliberately annoy people. And this was one of the most frustrating parts for me. So they might be deliberately annoying or provoking or irritating their classmates and their teachers, right? They say incredibly mean things like, you're stupid, or I wish you weren't even born. You're so ugly, right? They seem so mean. They have a really hard time following rules. So especially classroom rules, routines, and expectations, especially if you're asking them to do it every day. And if there has been any change in the schedule and they didn't get warning or they aren't finished an activity and it's time to move on to another subject, you're going to see kids who have ODD have problems with that. And then students with ODD frequently blame others for their problems or their misbehavior. They have a really hard time accepting personal responsibility, even when they were clearly responsible for the behavior. And finally, they can be very vindictive. So vindictiveness is a key hallmark of ODD students. In some cases, they might even engage in vindictive or spiteful behavior towards others when they perceive themselves as being wronged. So <laughs> all of these symptoms and you know characteristics of a child who has a ODD can make it really challenging to manage these students in their class in our classrooms. But remember, one of the hallmarks of children who have ODD is that they feel the need to control their environments in order to feel safe. So the more predictable and stable our classroom environment is, the less potential there is for outbursts and tantrums from your ODD students. So just a little caveat here, it makes a lot of sense that as a newer teacher, I would have a lot more trouble managing ODD students because I didn't have my classroom management dialed in. All the things we're going to talk about today, I was not being consistent. I was not doing a good enough job of controlling the environment environment for my students who had ODD. And so I had outbursts that felt like they were coming out of left field all the time. But honestly, because I, I wanted to point my finger at those students and say, look at how awful they were. But honestly, a lot of it was because I was not doing my job the way I needed to do it. If you've been listening to this podcast, podcast for a while now, you know, I am all about setting up a safe environment for learning. And we spend so much time at the beginning of the year, if you're academy members, creating an environment where students know that it's predictable and that they're safe in this environment. They know exactly how it's going to all work. That did not happen overnight, my friends. That took years of refining and perfecting and making sure my students felt safe and involved and empowered and part of my classroom. So please don't be too hard on yourself if you're a newer teacher and you're like, that's happening all the time. And my kids are like freaking out and I don't really know what to do and feels like they're constantly having outbursts and I'm at the end of my rope. (sighs) Take a deep breath yourself because I've been there. I totally understand that. You will improve. And as you improve, your students will feel safer because you feel more in control. The more in control we feel, the more in control our students are going to feel. The safer they're going to feel, the calmer we are. So this does come back to an interplay between how confident we feel in our how we're setting up our classroom and running our classroom and how comfortable and safe they feel. They feel our energy. They know if we're insecure. They know. They can sense this, especially students, like I mentioned earlier, who have been in unpredictable environments. They read adults like, that, like I'm sapping my fingers. They just really get it. They can read us like a book. That's a good thing. So stay open and have communication with these students. Let them know you're figuring out how to create a safe space for them. You're doing the best that you can, that you care about them. Just consistently keep that line of communication over open. So as I go through this list of, I have 12 different ways that you can manage these students and help them to feel successful. I want you to give yourself 
permission to be a learner yourself, to understand that a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are all things that you're learning too. Okay. So give yourself a break. You'll get there one thing at a time, implement things slowly, one step at a time. All right. So the first thing is clear expectations in your classroom. If you did not set consistent and clear classroom rules and expectations from the beginning of the school year, if you did not take the time to ensure that all students understand the rules and expectations and routines in your classroom, and you have not reviewed the rules regularly, you don't have visual reminders in the classroom. Those are all things that you can work on doing because the more consistent you can be in your expectations and in the way that you run your classroom every single day, the more safe these students are going to feel. Number two is to stay calm. Now I know it's pretty challenging to stay calm in the moment, but try to remember that this seriously is not about you. When a student says something or does something that is really off the rails or hurtful, I've often responded with this sentence that I think (laughs) works so beautifully. I've just said, well, that isn't very nice. Or wow, that's a really mean thing to say to someone who really cares about you. Right? So I'm communicating to them that that wasn't very nice. And that was mean when I really care about you. That isn't very nice, right? And then if what they've said or did was really hurtful, I'll remove myself from the situation. So I'll move away from them to calm myself first so that I don't say anything hurtful when I've been hurt. Because I think that's one of the hardest parts. It escalates, right? When they do something or say something that's hurtful or mean or awful, then I want to retaliate, right? Because I want to protect me and my ego and myself, (laughs) But the best thing we can do is to just take a breath and remove ourselves, just like we teach them to do. The third thing is, you've heard me talk about this so many times, positive reinforcement. I can't say enough about how acknowledging and focusing on all the good that student is doing can help to turn things around very quickly. So you can have a system of positive reinforcement to reward and acknowledge all of the good that you're seeing. You can use verbal praise, which is my favorite. You can use sticker charts. You can use tokens. You can use a weekly motivator. I give you these every single month inside the club so you can keep kids inspired and engaged. And so you can keep experimenting until you find what works for you and for this specific student. But why does it work with them? Because consistency is the key with these students. They need something tangible. They need to see the improvement that they're making. They need to actually have something they can count on. Now, I know rewards have had a really bad rap in education of late. So we do this thing in education where the pendulum swings and certain things become really bad for a while. The reality is as human beings, we love rewards. We all work for money. We all kids love to work for allowance so they can have money to spend on fun things. And it works with our students because especially for these kids, they need that tangible reinforcement until it either stops working or the student gets bored with it. So get prepared to change it up whenever it's not working and make sure whatever it is that the student is working towards, that the rewards are immediate and they're meaningful to the student. You need to involve them in choosing whatever it is that they're working towards so that they want to continue to do it. So I want you to take just a moment to think about who you're willing to listen to and who you're willing to take advice from in your life. So the people who you know like you and care about you, right? Those are the people that you're most interested in listening to and taking advice from. You know that they like and care about you because they've told you that. They've shown you in their actions, right? And it's the same with your students, whether they have ODD or not, ODD, yeah, ODD or not, you need to make sure that you're consistently letting them know all of the things that you like about them, all of the things that are great about them. Look for the positive, look for the good parts of them, look for the light in the darkness. Because remember, a lot of these kids, if they have come from unsettled environments, especially and environments that are not predictable, you being consistent and letting them know how great they are in finding the good in them might be the first time that they've ever experienced this in their lives. So that's the next thing. Number four is all about structured routines. So again, remember, it's about safety. So maintain a predictable daily schedule with consistent routines. I always talk about putting your daily schedule up on your wall. Make sure the kids know exactly what's coming and when. 
ODD students really benefit from knowing what to expect and it helps to reduce anxiety and the likelihood of outbursts. I did not have a daily schedule in the very beginning of my classroom. I did not have it posted on the on the wall of my classroom. And so I think the kids felt a little bit anxious because they didn't quite know what was happening. So I would take moments at the beginning of every day and teach them about what was going to happen throughout the day doesn't take very long. Also, if there's any changes, you want to let them know in advance. And then use those visual schedules, use timers with PowerPoint slides inside the classroom management club. I give you timers and PowerPoint slides for every subject throughout the entire day so that they know exactly what's going to be happening, how long it's going to take, and they can anticipate transitions between activities. Because those are also times when, because it's an unstructured moment, that these kids can go off the rails, right? Number five, all about clear instructions. Try to give simple, clear, and concise instructions. We tend to be really wordy. And you notice I'm slowing down. Choose your words carefully. Don't try to fill the space with a lot of words. So I added a cheat sheet to the Classroom Management Club to give my students step-by-step instructions to show you exactly how to do that. But giving clear directions is actually an art form. It's something, again, that takes time to practice. So you can work on this by slowing down, choosing your words carefully, and not giving too much information at once. So breaking tasks into smaller steps, if necessary, is very helpful. Use desk schedules if you want to, to help kids maintain a sense of control. Again, I give you these inside the impulse control resources inside the Classroom Management Club. And ensure that your students understand what is expected of them and provide any necessary support that they need. And let them know they can ask you if they don't understand. Three before me was the rule in my classroom. Ask three students before me. And if they they get to me, then clearly my instructions weren't clear enough, right? Number six, offer choices. So students need to understand whenever they are asked to do something that they have choices, right? To provide that sense of control. For example, you can allow them to choose between two activities or tasks. You can ask them or allow them the choice of doing this work independently or with a partner. But the choice to not do the work is not an option. I want to say that very clearly. Not doing the work is not an option. So ensure that the choices align with your classroom rules and your objectives and that they aren't getting away with doing something just because they don't want to do it, right? The choices need to fall within boundaries. Number seven, you really need to teach these kiddos self-regulation skills. We hear a lot about this. It's like the the big thing right now is SEL morning work or SEL work. But honestly, teaching students lessons on not just emotional regulation and self-control in the classroom, but all of the different things like flexibility and turn taking and all of the different things that kids need to know to be successful in their classroom and in their lives are skills that we are needing to teach these students. We can teach them deep breathing exercises, mindfulness, self-calming techniques when they're frustrated or overwhelmed. Inside the Classroom Management Club, I give you a meditation for every single month of the school year so that you can give kids options for how to self-regulate, how to calm themselves down, how to bring themselves back to the present moment, get a move out of anger back into peace. Number eight, you already probably have this in your classroom, but a safe space of some kind. Many teachers have calmed down corners in their classrooms where students can go when they need to de-escalate or regain control. You can stock this area with like sensory tools like meditations we just talked about or any materials that you think will help your students to self-soothe. And if you don't have space or a budget, teachers get caught up on this all the time. Don't worry. In my classroom, I had a desk by the window. And the reason I did this was so that the kids could look outside and just looking outside at nature seemed to calm them down. There was a parking lot, but there's also grass and a couple of trees, (laughs) but nothing fancy. They didn't even have meditations. They didn't have anything like that. But what they did have in my classroom at that time was tools that I taught them about breathing deeply, looking outside, going to a happy place, imagining that they were in their happiest place ever. Those kinds of things can really be helpful for students. It does not need to be fancy. In fact, we all need a space to take a break when we're feeling overwhelmed or overstimulated. So don't overthink this. Don't overcomplicate this. Just ask yourself, if I were feeling out of control and overwhelmed, what would be helpful for me right now? And then implement that for your students and teach your students how you do it. And then the other thing you can do is ask the child what they need to help them to calm down. Sometimes they already know what works best for them because this is an ongoing problem for them. This isn't new for them. Maybe there's something they like to do, but they need help from you to do that thing that helps them to calm down. 
Now, number nine, this is not going to surprise you. It's about communication and relationships. So take the time to build positive relationships with your students, especially the ones with ODD. Now, again, I know how hard this is, especially when they keep shutting you out. Again, I had a kid in fourth grade tell me he hated me every morning when I said good morning to him. And I just started to laugh. And I said, well, yeah, I think you're awesome. I like your jacket, right? <laughs> so I, would, <laughs> I just got tired of it. And I'm like, look it, I really like you. I think you're awesome. And I would try to find something positive in that child every single day. Was it easy? No, it was not easy. But by showing empathy to them, really listening to them when they have a problem and showing genuine interest in their well-being, those were the times when they would actually turn and warm to me. I won my bonus son over by doing exactly this. Because remember, he was coming from, a, his dad was married to somebody else right at the beginning. So I had extra resistance. And he really, I don't know, went against me many times. But the way I got through to him was through humor. I would just give him love right back. Every time he sent me something negative, I'd give him love right back. It's not easy for these kids. They live in a constant state of overwhelm and anxiety. And although it spills out all over the place in interaction with us, we are the adults in this relationship. Even though it may not feel like it, they're desperate for help. And we can't help them if we give up on them, right? I know it's hard, but also you have 20 or more other kids in your class who need you, many of whom probably adore you. So please don't attach your confidence and ability as a teacher to what this one child says to you. Continue to find the light, continue to be the light. And I promise you, now my bonus son calls all the time. He's like my favorite little guy because he's not so little. He's 25 now and he's six foot two. He's not so little. But his heart is tender and he adores me and I adore him because I really found my way through to him by being consistent in how I cared for him. That's all you have to do is consistency over time, sending love when they throw hate your way. And of course, very clear expectations. Number 10 is to involve support staff. I mentioned this very vaguely at the beginning, but I want you to make sure that you don't try to manage this alone. At every school, the support staff is named differently. So if there are special education professionals, counselors, behavior special, specialists, whoever it is at your school who can provide additional strategies and interventions that will help to be tailored to that individual student's needs, they're the specialists. This is what they do. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And if you don't know who it is at your school, ask your grade level team, ask your administrator, let them know you have a student who you think is ODD or who has been diagnosed and ask for help and, and strategies and support. They either will have someone that you can ask, they'll have a program that you can take, they'll have resources available for you, but don't stop asking until you get the help that you need or join us inside the club and we're all here to help you. Number 11, regular check-ins to hold kids accountable. You want to schedule regular check-ins with that student to discuss their progress, any challenges they may be facing, and adjust all your strategies as needed. So one week you may be working on, you know, not saying the word hate. That might be the goal. And they're working towards not saying the word hate every single day. And if they can do that, then they get something special on Fridays. But keep adjusting your strategies as you need to so that when they make meet certain milestones and they've gotten some success that they feel like they can celebrate it, but also are held accountable. And finally, I know this can be challenging sometimes, but involve parents or guardians Keep an open line of communication with them in your classroom. However you do that, teachers use Class Dojo. I had something called a, class, a home communication notebook that I used in my classroom. But make sure you're consistently sharing strategies that work in the classroom and ask for their insights about what works with their child at home because they have tons of experience with their child at home. And it's really helpful if you can kind of merge what you're doing at school with what they're doing at home and give more consistency for the child in terms of what you're working on and how they're being rewarded. Because maybe the actual goal that they're meeting is something that they get to do with their family at home on the weekend. Now, of course, none of what I'm suggesting here is easy, but I am suggesting that this is an opportunity for us all to practice what really unconditional love looks like in our daily lives. I mean, if it's this hard for us, can you imagine how hard it must be for those students, right? Now, the good news is that 
oppositional defiant disorder can get better or can go away over time. So according to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychology, for a lot of children, ODD does improve over time. So follow-up studies have shown that the signs and symptoms of ODD resolve within three years in approximately 67% of children who have been diagnosed. But also approximately 30% of children with ODD eventually develop conduct disorder. So depending on the child and depending on the circumstances, there's no hard and clear rule here, but there's definitely hope for these children, especially when they get help early and you can help to do that. So I will link to some resources that you might want to uh, go to for further reading. If you want more help and support with ODD and with managing ADHD students and all of your special snowflakes in your classroom, then go ahead and join us inside the Classroom Management Club. We'd love to have you. I will link to how you can join in the show notes for this episode, episode number 280. All right, my friends, I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week. And as always, remember, just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. Bye for now. Thank you.